We've talked about how a single playoff series permanently ruined careers before. We've talked about how a single possession have ruined careers. This time, however, let's take a look at how a single trade ruined the careers of these NBA studs, who were once adored by many fans. The damage done to their reputation was irreparable, and for most of these guys, they fell out of the league shortly after and was never the same player again. How's it going folks? My name's Andy, and today, let's take a look at how a single trade ruined these players forever. While the 2003 NBA Draft was a memorable, illustrious class filled with superstars that defined an entire generation, the most polarizing superstar of this bunch has to be Carmelo Anthony. Fans have always been divided on Melo. On one hand, he's always been a lethal scorer, with a deep offensive repertoire that can only be matched by few players in history. On the other hand, he never provided much of anything else besides that. His passing and defense in particular are two crucial aspects for any superstar, but for Melo, he never cared about anything except buckets. Some even have a hard time labeling him as a superstar, even back in his prime, because he didn't impact every single aspect of the game like you'd expect from a true superstar. But he has to put forth a better defensive effort. He's the leader of the team. It's not acceptable for a team that comes in with a four-game losing streak. Despite all that, he was still a highly respected scorer for many years in Denver and New York. On the Knicks, where his popularity reached a whole new level, Melo embraced the city he called home. His success on the court, however, was a mixed bag. In seven seasons in New York, Melo led them to the playoffs only three times, only one time past the first round. Yeah, you could say he underachieved. The anticipation of his arrival to New York was met with great expectations, which he clearly did not meet in his seven years there. Despite this, Melo was still an incredibly popular figure, and fans still loved him dearly, even though he had plenty of faults. However, by the summer of 2017, after four straight years of missing the playoffs, the Knicks traded him to the Oklahoma City Thunder, in a trade that initially seemed like a steal for the Thunder. All they had to give up was Ennis Cantor, Doug McDermott, and a second round pick for a reigning 10-time All-Star. Seems like a good deal, right? The Thunder did not foresee what would happen next. Um, how do you feel about coming <clears throat> off the bench? And the second question is... Who, me? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess that answers that part. I, I mean, I don't know where that started, where that came from. Hey, P, they said I gotta come off the bench. Up until his arrival to OKC, Melo has never came off the bench even once, in the 976 games he played for the Nuggets and Knicks. But his reaction to simply dismiss the notion that coming off the bench could be a possibility rubbed people the wrong way. There's a reason why Melo-led teams have never won the title, and in Oklahoma City, his worst qualities were on full display. Despite clearly being a shell of his former self, Melo still believed he was a superstar, and so he deserved superstar touches, instead of accepting his role to become more of a supporting player. Melo still took 15 shots a game and called for isos on nearly one-fifth of his possessions. In theory, the Thunder hoped him being the third scoring option on this team would help him play off the ball more, kinda like how he plays in the Olympics. Melo thrives when he's not the guy controlling the offense. So that's what OKC thought they were getting, Olympic Melo. Yet what they actually got was the worst version of Melo we'd ever see. He registered a career low in efficiency, and his ball-stopping tendencies never changed from New York. The result? A team that finished with just one more win compared to the previous year, and once again went home early with another first-round exit. The Thunder organization under Sam Presti have always been very quick and efficient in their decision making. So right after the season ended, they made it clear to Melo that he was gone. According to Melo himself, coach Billy Donovan called him while he was on vacation, and straight up told Melo, nah, we don't think it's going to work here anymore. Melo's lone season in OKC was the turning point in his career. It was the moment when everyone realized a team will never win a championship when he has such a prominent role. With several short stints on other teams in the twilight years of his career, he slowly but surely faded into the sunset. 
as he retired in the role that he never wanted to accept. A bench player. I don't think I've ever seen a former MVP get blasted as much as Russell Westbrook in his later years. He's always been a polarizing player, somebody you either love or hate, but I feel like at the peak of his prime, he certainly had way more lovers than haters. That would quickly change though, and I still remember one of the biggest question marks of Westbrook was how his game was going to age as he got older. As arguably the most explosive point guard in history, a player who relies on this much athleticism has to find a way to adapt and change. Or else, his game will look very ugly. Unfortunately for Westbrook, it's been more of the latter. He's been skirting that fine line between adapting and stagnating. Since the original trade that sent him to LA, his game got examined under a microscope. Everyone started to realize, perhaps he'll never change. While Westbrook still had the mindset of a superstar, he no longer had the skills of one. In the 2021-22 season, the first full year with Westbrook at point guard, the Lakers finished with an abysmal 33 wins. With him on the floor, the team had a negative 4.2 net rating. When he was off the floor, they were much better, though still not great. In combination with the intense media circus in Los Angeles, this single trade, along with his salary, it utterly destroyed his reputation forever. Heck, even his short-lived Clippers tenure was a hit or miss. Sure, he had some great moments, and briefly revived his career. But then you fast forward to the 2024 playoffs, and Westbrook had another classic West Brick series, as he shot 13 for 50 in the series against Dallas, good for 26% from the field. I wish I said he contributed in other areas, but he really didn't. With fewer than two assists per game, Needless to say, Westbrook's tumultuous later years have only damaged his status. But hopefully, down the road, we'll look back to his prime and think of him fondly for what he's accomplished. He single-handedly ignited the triple-double revolution and made a joke out of this once prominent stat, and it's no longer glorified like it used to be. Allen Iverson was once considered the most influential player in basketball, as his cultural impact extended far beyond the court. However, have you ever wondered why we never talk about his career after Philly? He spent 10 years in Philly, but after that, Iverson had arguably the worst later years of any superstar in history, culminating in his departure from the NBA at the age of 34. But let's rewind a bit. At the beginning of the 2008-9 season, the Nuggets had a falling out with Iverson, and he got traded to the Detroit Pistons. His initial reaction was that of joy, as he stated to the press, I'm very excited about this trade. For the Pistons, after several playoff disappointments, they went in a different direction and thought Iverson would provide a new dimension to this team, and perhaps even boost ticket sales. The excitement went both ways, as Iverson needed a fresh new start to revitalize his career. Little did he know, this trade would actually ignite his downfall. In the beginning, he seamlessly fit in and became the Pistons' primary scorer. But as the season progressed, Iverson saw his role slowly and slowly decrease. It got to the point where he was getting outplayed by Pistons' 22-year-old sophomore Rodney Stuckey. So Iverson got benched. Can you guess what happens next? Yup, he hated it so much that instead of supporting his teammate, he made this statement to the media. Quote, I'm in a position now that I've never been in my whole life. I can't be effective playing this way. I'm not used to it. It's tough for me both mentally and physically. Like Mello, Iverson never felt comfortable coming off the bench and believed he was far too skilled to be taking a backseat to somebody like Rodney Stuckey. Then, it got worse. In the summer of 09, he barely got any lucrative offers. For a guy who's literally on a streak of 10 consecutive All-Star selections, that's crazy. He's Allen Iverson, for crying out loud. How can he not get a contract? But it became understood among the NBA community that Iverson was demanding a far bigger role than any team was willing to give him. Eventually, when he settled for a measly one-year, $3 million deal with Memphis, he left the team after playing just three games for them, indicating that, once again, he refused to come off the bench and accept a lesser role. I don't know any Olympian that come off the bench. I don't know any All-Star 
off, come off the bench. I don't know any former MVP, but come off the bench. I don't know any three-time scoring champion, come off the bench. Why Allen Iverson? Iverson's unwillingness to become a mentor combined with his stubbornness to think he still got it, these things forced him to leave the NBA quicker than we thought. You could say the trade to Detroit initiated his downfall. But with how it ended, he could have joined any other team and his career still would have gone the same way if he didn't change his attitude. Few players in NBA history have went from a key contributor to a championship roster, a sixth man of the year, to completely incompetent after a single trade that wrecked their confidence. Lamar Odom is the perfect example of a player who took it personally when he got traded, and felt like he got betrayed. Perhaps all the tragedy in his life contributed to this. Odom had seen several members of his family, including his own son, suffer a traumatic premature death. This was something he struggled with through his entire NBA career, but when hearing the news that the Lakers were shopping him around in trade rumors, he took it very hard. In fact, Remember the trade that was supposed to send Chris Paul to the Lakers? Well, in that trade, the Lakers included Odom in the package, and when he found out, he felt so disrespected, and immediately requested a trade. The Chris Paul trade fell through due to some, you know, shady circumstances, but Odom still wanted out. When first arriving to Dallas, Mark Cuban had some high expectations of him, but sadly, Odom did not perform anywhere close to his former self. Have to love it. And Lamar Odom has just checked in, and here's the reaction. The Mavs thought they were getting a reigning sixth man of the year, but what they really got was a man who simply did not give a crap, and had by far the worst season of his career. This trade ruined him so much, he didn't even look like he belonged in the league anymore. It's like all his basketball talent got sapped by the Monstars or something. Odom didn't even stick around long enough to help them on their playoff run, as he left the team before the start of the postseason. Just one year after this, Odom's NBA career was done. This single trade essentially marked the end of his career, not just in the NBA, but off the court, he spiraled down further than we'd ever imagine. Lamar Odom was said to be involved in a three-car collision that was not reported to authorities six days before the NBA veteran and reality star's arrest, both incidents on the very same freeway. First, it was drugs. Then, it was a DUI arrest. Then, his wife Khloe Kardashian filed for divorce. Then, he was hospitalized for an overdose and placed on life support. Thankfully, he recovered. If there was a poster boy for former All-Stars who completely vanished without a trace, look no further than Roy Hibbert, the man who popularized verticality to its absolute limit. A defensive anchor back in his day, Hibbert held the Pacers' front line to back-to-back -back seasons with the number one ranked defense. Everyone remembers Hibbert for his contributions to these Pacers teams, the team that tried to challenge the Big Three era in Miami. Out of all teams in the East, they were the only ones who had a chance to stop them, even if that chance was very low. It wasn't just a single trade that ended his career, but you could tell his value on the court was slowly diminishing over the years. In the 2014 playoffs, the last time he appeared in the postseason, Hibbert had some truly horrendous performances. He became the laughingstock. Of his 19 playoff games that year, he recorded 3 or fewer rebounds in 7 of those 19 games. That's a complete joke for a supposed 7'2 beast of a human, yet he got pushed around by guys much smaller than him? While the Pacers reached the conference finals that year, they struggled immensely against small ball lineups, because Hibbert was so slow-footed he could not keep up. Little did we know, this would be a stark foreshadowing of things to come. When Paul George broke his leg, the Pacers used this as an opportunity to restart and rebuild, thus trading away Roy Hibbert in the process. So when he arrived to Los Angeles, his lack of adaptability was obvious. For his entire life, Hibbert defined the role of a traditional big man, and he fit on the Pacers who typically ran traditional lineups, with a traditional center like him. 
Unfortunately, during this time of the small ball revolution, Hibbert fell behind, and his production was no longer effective in a landscape where almost every team was going small, and they needed their center to be more versatile. In the immediate aftermath of the trade, Hibbert saw his numbers basically get cut in half. Soon after, at the age of 30, Hibbert played his final game in the NBA. We could all see it coming, but this trade became the final nail in the coffin. Unlike other stars who see their careers fade away due to arrogance or stubbornness, for Hibbert, it was his skill set that could not keep up. And due to the nature of his body and his lack of shooting touch, he really could not adapt his game fast enough. Perhaps it was bad timing. If he was drafted in 2020 or something, in an era where the big men are coming back, maybe his size could help him last longer in a new generation. Anyway, that's all folks. Those were 5 NBA studs whose careers got ruined by a single trade. Let me know in the comment section your thoughts on this video. Can you think of any other players who could fall into this category? Thank you all so much for watching. I hope y'all enjoyed the video. And of course, as always, I'll see you next time. Peace.